it's time to give out some awards and then it's time to say goodbye. We're handing out some end of season awards now that the season officially is over uh, with the event of the draft. We're going to say, uh, say some goodbyes and say some awesome things about the Kings. All that on today's episode of Locked On Los Angeles Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Kings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Kings fans, happy Friday or Saturday or whenever it is you happen to open your podcast app. My name is Sarah, and for one last time, I'm the host of Locked on Los Angeles Kings, uh, talking to you about your favorite hockey team and mine, the Los Angeles Kings. On today's show, uh, if you heard yesterday's show, uh, well, this is the official one. This is the official uh, goodbye for me. Uh, on Monday, you're going to get uh, Take It Over by Eddie Garcia, who has been a delight to talk to, who I'm very pleased uh, to hand the show off to. Uh, he'll be kicking things off right away with talking about the draft. Uh, there's some rumors of an Adrian Kempe extension, so I can guarantee that you should be tuning in for Eddie's first show on Monday because he's going to take you through all of that. But for me uh, to say goodbye to all of you, uh, I solicited some questions from you guys on Twitter. Uh, we'll talk about those towards the end of the show. Uh, but I figured it's time to finally get around to uh, revealing the results to the second annual Locked on Los Angeles Kings end of season awards poll, which I, you know, sent out later than expected in the first place and then just didn't get around to, you know, uh, don't want to show about uh, until right now. But I figured what better way to end our time together, you and me, uh, if you've been here since day one or you're just finding the show now, I figured it was a great way to, uh, to, to, yeah, end our time together with me leading the show off uh, by, uh, by just talking about some really nice stuff because that's that's what makes this fun is talking about some really nice stuff so we're just going to talk about your answers to the awards uh some of you had some really great thoughts uh feedback funny things to bring up so we're gonna we're just gonna dive into it uh, and the first one is you know if you didn't do the survey there are many serious questions on there about you know best newcomer and mvp and all that stuff but you know this is me I, of course i'm gonna ask some slightly irreverent questions, maybe you could say, uh, in the poll. So the first question we're going to talk about, the first award we're going to hand out is for the best Kings team dog not named Goosel. Goosel like runs away with every award, every poll. Uh, the fact that he doesn't win Bark Madness every year, I feel like has to be some sort of conspiracy theory set up something because everyone loves Goosel. So I figured, you know, let's just get that one out of there right off the bat. Gustel has his own award category called best team dog named Gustel. All right. Uh, so the best team dog not named Gustel uh, is actually a tie here because, uh, well, there's a lot of good team dogs here. Uh, number one, Dudley Byfield, Quentin Byfield's dog, a very good dog, very good friend. I think he actually just posted uh, some Instagram content with the dog fairly recently. So Dudley Byfield, A plus choice. Murphy Moore, also a really good choice. Those two came in a tie, and uh, I would give the crown to both of them. I think, for me, the underrated team dog, not named Gusto, and this is just current dogs. I know one of you on Twitter asked about my favorite King's dog. Uh, we'll get more into, like, historical King's dogs later, but my favorite current King's dog, not named Gusto, I think that Cal Peterson's dog is really underrated. Um, whenever I was at the King's game where they actually did the, like, bark madness they had the like dog race across the ice and everything uh there was a very good dog and i was like whose dog is that it's a you know black and white and gray big floofy thing uh, i was like who's that it turned out to be cal peterson's dog and then saw like i think i think we saw murphy moore walking around the concourse after the game that was also very exciting uh but i i would give some bonus points to cal peterson's dog because it's not your traditional hockey man dog i liked it a lot also honorable mention uh, to Milo Brown, one final time uh, to to give Dustin Brown's pup some love. So A++ to Milo Brown, who I feel like we don't know what Dustin Brown's doing with the rest of his life, but he's basically already said, like, we're sticking around here. We're not going anywhere. So I have the feeling that Milo Brown, listen, if we can vote on, like, Luke Robitaille's dog, 
as part of Bark Madness and stuff, we should definitely uh, still be able to vote for Milo Brown for things in the future. But uh, congrats to Dudley Byfield and Murphy Moore, both winners, co-winners of the best team dog not named Gustel here at the Locked On Los Angeles Kings end of season's award poll. Question number two, a player who you love with your whole heart, even though maybe he's a little bit mediocre and you shouldn't love him as much as you do, but okay, don't judge me. I would also basically call this like the Nick Shore Award. Uh, if you uh, remember the Nick Shore days of him being just a perfectly cromulent fourth line center, unspectacular, but you know, sometimes you just really, really love an average hockey player. Uh, this one had a lot of really varied responses, uh, including some guys who I'm like, I don't know that he's like underrated or mediocre, but okay. Uh, but the uh, the the clear winner here was Rasmus Kapari, which I thought was interesting. Um, I feel like really a lot of these people who you guys uh, suggested as someone who uh, who could win this award, you know, Gabe Velarde came up, Jared Anderson Dolan came up, uh, Carl Grundstrom, Blake Lazat, uh, Leas Anderson. Uh, we're seeing a lot of guys who maybe have achieved at the lower level at the AHL, uh, but just haven't quite pulled it together at the NHL level. And, you know, I think that's where Rasmus Kapari comes in. I think he'll have moments where he looks really, really good, really effective, and then just disappears for a long stretch. Like, I felt like he started out the season okay. I wasn't mad about the fact that he earned a spot on the team. Uh, but, you know, things just sort of, they, they lose the momentum. They lose the, like, oomph that they had that got them there. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if I would say that he's a little mediocre. I would say that he's still trying to figure it out. Of course, he's coming off of that really bad knee injury a couple of seasons ago that basically wiped out a whole year for him. Uh, so that kind of factors in too. But yeah, he's definitely a player, you know, first round pick. He's someone who I want to see a lot more from. Uh, and if he's not going to achieve more than he is, then I want to see him embrace that kind of bottom six role uh, and, and really lean into it. Uh, I feel like uh, Trevor Lewis is always kind of my example of a guy who was picked high in the draft, him like Cal Clifford picked high, but had to adjust their games to suit for the NHL. It's like, if you want to be successful in this league, not everyone is an elite sniper. Not everyone is going to come into this league, league and be Connor McDavid or whoever. And so you have, you got, you got to do what's going to keep you employed. And some players can make that adjustment. Some players can't. Uh, but Rasmus Kapari, definitely someone who I want to see more from in the future and someone who I think I, I think I think he can get there. Uh, I, I think that it's just, you know, anyone who's drafted in the first round, there's always sort of that stigma, uh, not stigma, but there's the expectation of how you're going to perform. And when you don't, everyone, it's like the end of the world. Look, Adrian Kempe just had his breakout season this year. Uh, first round draft pick. He's like, what, 24, 25, whatever he is. It just takes guys some time. So there's still time for Rasmus Kapari, but yeah, could be better. Next up, your favorite food option at, uh, I can't believe it's not Staples Center. The New Burger Place got two responses. The New Burger Place. I like that there's no name for it. It's just the New Burger Place. So next time I'm there, I'm just going to walk around until I see a New Burger Place. Uh, a couple of votes that also are favorites of mine, uh, the Wetzel's Pretzels, uh, which of course is, as the response calls it, a Staples Center staper, st a Staples Center staple. You try saying that like five times fast. Uh, of course, the Wetzel, I mean, I'm just a sucker for a soft pretzel anyway, just a delicious load of carbohydrates. Uh, but the Little Bird Chicken Stand, Honestly, it's my favorite place at uh, at the arena to eat. I feel like every time I'm there, I have the intent of eating somewhere else. I have the intent of trying something new. And then I just go back to the darn chicken place. Uh, so, you know, old habits die hard. But the new burger place uh, got some votes from you guys. So I'm, I'm excited to see what the new burger place is next time I'm out there. We've got uh, some more thoughts, including uh, your favorite arena to visit. We've got MVPs. We've got uh, most improved players, all that stuff coming up next on Locked on Los Angeles Kings. But before we get to that, of course, Bet Online is here to be your number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. No matter what it is you're into, if it's baseball, basketball, football, hockey, obviously, esports, fighting, anything like that, you can find 
all the latest developments, league reviews and news. You can get podcasts, you can get uh, sports wagering information, live betting, all that stuff on Bet Online. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and even golf. So whatever it is you're into, if you're already thinking about predicting who's going to win the Stanley Cup next year, guess what? There's odds for that on Bet Online. So go and check it out. Head over to the website today uh, or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet Online, it is where the game starts. Next up, we're going to take a look at uh, some more categories, including your favorite away arena to visit. Uh, this one got some pretty varied responses. Uh, Honda Center actually got a, a couple a couple votes. So uh, congrats to the aggressively orange Honda. But the number one favorite away arena to visit, Madison Square Garden, kind of ran away with this one. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I, I can't say you're wrong. I, I went out there a couple years ago. I was in New York for unrelated reasons and looked at the, the Rangers schedule and I was like, oh, there's a game. Let's just go to Madison Square Garden. First off, I will say that it is like mad expensive, like for no good reason, mad expensive, uh, other than the fact that it's Madison Square Garden. I ended up actually buying like a really good seat because I was like, well, the difference between the seat way up there and the nosebleeds and the seat way down here honestly wasn't significant enough. I was like, I'm just going to pay the extra whatever uh, and sit sit down there. I was expecting... Like, so I have a lot of friends who live in Toronto and I hear a lot about Leafs games and I hear a lot of people complaining that like, it's very like corporate. It's very much a lot of like people who go there just to be seen. Um, you know, Leafs fans can argue with this all they want. I've never been to a Leafs game. I can't really tell you, but I feel like that's a thing you hear a lot about Leafs games. It's just kind of dead. And I sort of expected the same from Madison Square Garden, but I will be honest, the crowd was super into it. The atmosphere was really good. Uh, obviously, beautiful, historic arena, um, and had some of my favorite food choices that I've ever been to or that I've ever seen at an arena. Like, I got a really good, like, chicken teriyaki bowl or something. I was like, this is pretty good. Uh, so, you know, haven't visited all the arenas yet, uh, but Madison Square Garden, I would absolutely go back there as long as it doesn't cost like $8 billion to go there. Uh, another arena got a nod that I particularly enjoyed was the Climate Pledge Arena, Seattle's new arena. Uh, I was out there for a game at the very end of the season uh, and really want to go back. I feel like I didn't get to experience the full excitement of the brand new arena, but very beautiful place. Sight lines are great. Those two weird jumbotron things are really awesome for like just seeing things. Uh, they actually close caption all their videos, which is great because you can understand what they're saying because uh, they all mumble and, you know, it's loud. Uh, but uh, Climate Pledge Ar Arena, I think as more people get to it, I'm pretty sure is going to jump right up there uh, in terms of favorite arenas. Let's get into some uh, favorite moments uh, from different players, favorite moments uh, in games. Uh, asked about your favorite Dustin Brown moment uh, for his career, not just uh, in this season. And obviously 2012 was huge. Uh, I think if I aggregate all of the responses that mentioned anything from that 2012 uh, playoff run, winning the cup, that's going to be the runaway winner uh, for, for your favorite Dustin Brown moment. So lifting the cup in 2012, the hat trick against Chicago in 2012 at the trade deadline, uh, basically Dustin Brown just going out, playing his game, showing why he wasn't going to get traded. Huge, huge moment. Uh, the Sedin hit got some nods. Uh, obviously, that was a cl clip that played on repeat uh, as soon as Dustin Brown announced uh, that he was going to be retiring. That's just the headline of the, uh, the, uh, the um, what do you call it, the highlights package. Uh, so just, uh, you know, 2012, I feel like you can never talk much uh, enough about how important that win was for this franchise, that win was for the city, uh, and how great it was to see Dustin Brown lift that cup. Uh, there was one response that I do want to read out from someone uh, who said they were at a Tippa King event many years ago uh, when it was at Universal Studios, which included tickets to the theme park. Uh, and then uh, there was also like a private section for walking around, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they were at the Animal Actors show uh, and at one point looked over behind them and saw Dustin Brown, Anja Kopitar, and Drew Doughty all sitting back uh, pretty close to them. Uh, and they got the smile and wave from Dustin Brown. I feel like that's that's always a great, you know, no matter who it is, if it's one of your favorite players, you see them out in the wild, 
uh, always a good one. So glad you got to experience that uh, Dustin Brown moment. But obviously, anything related to 2012 comes away as a huge, huge winner uh, for everyone when we're, when we're thinking about favorite Dustin Brown moments. Looking at players who aren't going to be on this team in this franchise anymore. Uh, again, a lot of varied responses here, including a couple that surprised me <laughs> that we'll talk about. Uh, the, the two kind of co-winners, losers here, I guess. Olimata, Gabe Velarde. Uh, Velarde got a bunch of like sad, smiley faces with him. Olimata, no one really seemed to have a lot of sad feelings about. Uh, we have heard that uh, Rob Blake is trying or has explored re-signing either Mata or Edler. So who knows? Ma uh, Mata might be back. Uh, Gabe Velarde, it, it, it's going to be so interesting to see what happens with him. Um, I've said this on this show. I've said this on other shows I've been on. He's definitely a player who I think, like, you can see the potential in him, but I don't know that he's going to get there. Um, I, I just don't know that he has the, like, personality it's a whole other podcast episode, you know, or maybe I'll just, you know, since this is it for me, maybe I'll just like write about it. Uh, but Gabe Velarde, a lot of people could see him not being part of this team. I could absolutely see him being part of a package uh, to land another player because uh, at the end of the day, even if you do believe in Gabe Velarde and his promise and potential, there's only so many spots at forward and uh, we might not have enough. But uh, Olivada, kind of the uh, the, the biggest normal consensus, I guess you could say. Uh, the ones that surprised me, we had a couple of nods for Sean Walker and Matt Roy, uh, who, you know, that th those are guys who I feel like they're the like, we're one guy away and we need to make a big move and it's going to involve sending a player out kind of thing. I know there's talk about, you know, if the Kings upgrade their blue line, you have to move someone. Uh, we'll, we'll see. But th those are those are interesting ones to pop up there as uh, players you think might not be here next year. Most memorable goal. Uh, Adrian Kempe uh, kind of ran away with this one too, uh, with his goal in the playoffs, silencing the Edmonton crowd, that overtime winner from Adrian Kempe, uh, the, you know, can, can you hear, can I hear you? Like, uh, it's just one of those moments of, you know, Kempe is such a like, this is going to be the like most mom thing I've ever said on the show. Just like a very like cool cucumber, right? Like doesn't celebrate his goals that much. Like doesn't really get that pumped up. And so seeing him with that overtime winner against the Oilers, uh, just silencing that crowd, just the perfect attitude to go along with it. Uh, big, big moment for Kempe. And I think was really uh, something that kind of capped off a great season for him. Obviously would have liked for the Kings to get out of the first round, but look, we, we all saw the avalanche, right? It, it wouldn't have gone very far. But Adrian Kempe, obviously, uh, with a real big moment this season. Uh, the Kopitar game against Vegas in the season opener, uh, the home opener or whatever, got a lot of nods as well for a favorite moment, a favorite goal, because that was, that was a game. I was like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> what is happening here? MVP of the team, again, no... Uh, no question here. Overwhelming landslide win. Phil Deneau is your MVP. You agree with, with it. Uh, uh, Deneau won the Kings, their team awards for MVP. Absolutely great uh, first season from him as a King. Exceeded everybody's expectations uh, and just instant fan favorite uh, for this fan base. So uh, it... it, it <laughs> With Deneau sort of centering that second line uh, that was at times literally the best line in hockey, uh, just just such a huge asset to this team. And, you know, would kind of shudder to think where the team would have ended up in the standings without him, uh, given the role that he played. So easy one here. Uh, Phil Deneau, most valuable player on the Kings this season. Also another easy winner here. Former King you'd most like to have back on the team, Tyler Toffoli. Uh, everyone would be glad to see him come back. We also had some nods for Alec Martinez, Curtis McDermott. So I see you, person who likes the the, the grit, uh, and Jeff Carter for sentimental reasons. Matt Luff got a couple of nods too. He's you know I, I get to see enough of him uh, playing in the AHL since he's kind of split his time 
uh, has played with the Milwaukee Admirals a little bit too. Matt Luff's a guy who I'm like, oh, I mean, I just wish he could put it together at the NHL level uh, because he, he's a very fun player when he has it going, but just the consistency, man. Like, but I gotta say, I miss Meatball Luff a whole lot. But Tyler Toffoli, obviously, everyone wants him back on this team. Uh, still comes and hangs out in Cal, you know, still has his home here. Uh, he, he also, apparently, if you're not big on social media and like like I am keeping up with everyone's weird lives, uh, he and his wife and some friends went to Austin, Texas on vacation. And guess who they ran into? Tanner Pearson. So there's some really great uh, Instagram content of Tyler Toffoli and Tanner Pearson running back into each other by accident in Texas. And they even like, obviously they didn't know that they both had on like gray shorts and black shorts or whatever. Like they accidentally matched. It was really great. But yeah, it, I, it, I would take Tyler Toffoli back in a second. Sure. The top six is kind of already rounded out with uh, you know the acquisition of Kevin Fiala last season, bringing in Victor Arvidsson. Uh, we've got a good top six now, but man, I, I yeah, Tyler Toffoli, we'd all take him in, in a second. Most disappointing player. I feel like I should have saved all the bummers for like later or something, but Cal Peterson was the kind of clear winner here as most disappointing player. And I can't say that I disagree with that. Uh, Cal Peterson has this big new contract kicking in. Uh, he has been set up as the future of this franchise, uh, had, Every every the, every like advantage given to him, uh, every everything indicated that yeah he was ready to make that next step and he did not, and it's very fortunate that Jonathan Quick performed the way he did this past season. Uh, Jonathan Quick got the Kings into the playoffs. Jonathan Quick uh, kept them there uh, through all seven games, uh, but yeah, Cal Peterson, this is going to be such a fascinating storyline to watch this coming season because they're counting on him to improve his game, to become the goaltender that we all know he can be. Uh, and if he doesn't, the Kings have problems. So I cannot uh, disagree at all with your, uh, your results on this one. One of my favorite categories here, the Justin Williams Honorary Team Dad Award. Dustin Brown, of course, Dustin Brown wins this one. Uh, I'm really excited to see what is next for Dustin Brown in his life, basically. Uh, like I said earlier, he's been pretty open about, yeah, we're staying here. Our family, like this is where our family lives. This is our home. We're not going back to to, to, to New York or wherever. This is it. We're, we're here. Um, he, if he wants a job with the Kings doing anything, he has it. Like he's just got it. And I would love to see him take on a role working with prospects or working with, you know, the AHL, uh, any sort of prospect development kind of thing. I, I think that, you know, you, Dustin Brown is polarizing to many people, largely non-Kings fans, but this is a guy who had a very long career, was very durable, uh, even after the whole stripped of the captain, captaincy thing, was always thought of as a great leader in this room. Uh, and you can see that in the the respect given to him uh, at, at the end of the season when he officially, you know, retires, plays his last games. Uh, this is a guy who, you know, if my 18, 19, 20 year old kid was turning into a pro hockey player with the Kings, I'd want him to learn from Dustin Brown uh, about how to be a pro, how to keep your, keep your body healthy. Like all the things that, you know, they need someone to tell them who's been there. And I think the Dustin Brown just, I really want to see him, in that kind of role. And uh, it's a very team dad kind of role. Best dressed king. Usually this award goes to Adrian Kempe, no question, uh, no competition. But this year he's got a challenger. Kempe still just barely edged out a win here in this category. He's got that great European dude sense of style. But Quentin Byfield, Quentin Byfield is coming for you, Adrian Kempe. Uh, Quentin Byfield understands the assignment uh, when it comes to dressing up and looking good. Uh, he has, you know, he could unseat Adrian Kempe very easily in the near future. So watch out. Watch out. Also, a nod for Victor Arvidsson, uh, continuing that great tradition of Swedish guys just knowing how to bring it. But Quentin Byfield, he'll be, he'll be the best dressed king. He'll, he'll, he'll do it. 
one of the next questions, uh, best celebration, best goal celebration. Uh, and Adrian Kempe won this one too. That same goal against Edmonton was the one that uh, really got people talking here as well. Uh, so Adrian Kempe silencing that Edmonton crowd uh, came up the big winner here, uh, <laughs> here for the Locked on Kings uh, end of season awards. We're going to finish out our awards and uh, answer a couple more questions from listeners uh, on the show. But of course, this is Locked on Los Angeles Kings. And thank you for making this your uh, first listen of the evening, day, whenever you open your podcast app. Always glad to have you here uh, as listeners or viewers on YouTube, uh, whether you've been here from day one or if you're just joining the show now. Uh, it's always a delight to, uh, to be able to share the thoughts with y'all out there. Next one, best Kings player on social media. Anja Kopitar got some nods for this one. Uh, he does a great job on social media sharing, of course, team stuff. But also, if you're into the best team dog named Gustel, well, if you want Gustel content, that's where you find it. Anja Kopitar's social media. Uh, there's also a couple of nods for Cal Peterson, Sean Dersey, who are both very funny on social media. I feel like you have to like look for it though because they're always funny in the comments of other people's posts so sometimes someone's going to post a picture you got to go back like the next day and then read all the guys chirping each other uh there was the one that just just uh went around twitter a little bit ago of a guy on the canucks posting a, a picture and it was him scoring on cal peterson and peterson was like man really <laughs> you got you got to do me like this uh so we, we've got some uh some funny guys uh adrian Kempe also gets a nod his social media is basically all just him looking like a model. So, you know, I, I can go along with that one as well. Next up in the uh, end of season awards here, uh, we, we looked at player you'd most like to see the Kings acquire in the off season. Phil, or not Philip Forsberg. Philip Forsberg is on here. Uh, Kevin Fiala did not make this list. So unfortunately, none of you are psychic in this one. But Forsberg and Jake Chitron, obviously the guys that everyone wants to uh to acquire they're the big names that won this one uh, there was a a little lonely vote for alex to bring it sorry we didn't get that one i would have loved it it would have been amazing but uh of course jake chitron who everyone is still still after and there's still time there's still time to make it happen uh and of course uh the vote for not really making any moves and promoting our kids to fill these holes in the lineup uh, and letting the team grow from within, which is honestly not a bad take. Most memorable game this season and why. There's a couple interesting ones in here that I want to bring up. Uh, one of them, the season op opener against Vegas, the hat trick from Andre Kopitar, the five-point night. Uh, yeah, that one was huge. That game was, I feel like if anything is going to set the tone for this season, it was that game. It was the Kings coming, roaring out of the gate, saying that we're here. We're not just going to roll over because you're the Vegas Golden Knights. Also, it was a really great like picture of things to come for Vegas because I think I think the way it ended up shaking out was that if Vegas had won like literally one more game, they would have made the playoffs. I think it was like that. <laughs> and yeah, that's really funny thinking about that game in that context of uh, just exactly how much work the Kings did to dash their playoff hopes. That was really great. Um, the final regular season game for Dustin Brown playing at Vancouver got some nods to watching him get the C for that one last game, the recognition for him. That was a huge one. That was such a, like, no one knew that was going to happen, obviously, like outside of the guys on the team. Uh, and so whenever I feel like we all saw that, uh, I definitely had way more feelings than I, I did not expect to have about a game against Vancouver. Uh, that was a really just sentimental kind of favorite uh for uh for this for this past season uh we also had Tyler Toffoli returning uh with Montreal the Kings won the game uh that was just a fun one everyone like we said Tyler Toffoli is topping the list of Kings that we'd want or former Kings we'd want back on the team uh everyone just such a warm welcome for him uh very excited to have him back so that was a, just a really great moment uh, we had, of course, the game at Boston uh, where Trevor Moore scores. Andreas Athanasiou wins it over in overtime. That was a huge one. And uh, one, one one that's like, you know, most important, favorite, most memorable game, memorable game 
but like maybe not for great reasons, but the game three against the Oilers showing how much work the Kings have ahead of them. And I think this is like an important point to make because like, it's one thing to get to the playoffs. It's a whole other thing to go the whole distance. And that game, it was just a mess. It was a mess. And the team getting to see exactly what it takes to succeed in the playoffs, what it takes to, to be able to fight your way through and everything. I think that's a really important moment. Uh, you know, act like you've been there before, whatever. You got to learn how to lose. You got to learn how to whatever. Uh, but I, I think that that loss showed the team a lot about what, what they have to do. Uh, and so, yeah, it's not memorable in a, you know, hat trick, five points, whatever kind of way. But I think that's a really good thing to think about is, you know, seeing how the team adjusts and moves forward uh, to not have games like that again. Taking a look at prospects, best Kings prospects, not in the NHL. This one's a tie. Brant Clark, Martin Chromiak. Uh, a lot of love for both of those guys. Uh, one person actually said both of them. So kudos to you for just taking advantage of the uh, the free form result uh, survey box thing there. Uh, but yeah, two guys we're very excited to see more from. Uh, we should see them both at training camp, rookie camp, and everything soon. Uh, so I'm really, uh, really excited to see what they look like. Uh, Brant Clark, obviously, we didn't get to see uh, at King's camp because he was sick. So this will be kind of our first chance to look at him with, uh, with the Kings as a whole. I asked you guys what song describes the Kings season this year, and y'all said Black Parade. I'm not even going to argue with it. Can't complain. A, it's a great song. B, they played it to the draft, and everyone was like, are you stealing our bit? Uh, but no, Black Parade, I love that they brought it back for the playoffs. Uh, no, com no complaints, no notes. Black Parade, done. Best forward, Phil Deneau. Again, landslide here. Uh, also some nods for Kopitar, Kempe, Trevor Moore, uh, all very important players on this team. But Phil Deneau definitely uh, runs away with this one from all you guys. Best defenseman, Drew Doughty's always going to get votes here. Drew Doughty technically, I think, wins this one. But Sean Dursey got a lot of love here, particularly for the fact that no one expected him to be here, right? Everyone expected Sean Dursey to be in the AHL, maybe get some games, uh, but not step up and become a leading figure on this team on the blue line for a large chunk of the season. So a lot of love for Sean Dursey as the team's best defenseman, uh, particularly in a role that no one thought he's going to be playing. Unsung hero of the team. Uh, we got a lot of different ones for this one. Uh, so no clear winner on this one. We had Brendan Lemieux, Ole Mata got some love, Matt Roy, Carl Grundstrom, Blake Lazat, Victor Arvidsson, all those guys picking up some love uh, from you guys. I think I'd probably give the award to Blake Lazat, uh, a player who has overcome is not the right word, but he, he's a player who at times, you know, I, I thought that he was going to be the odd man out, right? Like, I, I just didn't know where he fit in on this team. But despite, like, there being plenty of opportunities for other players to kind of seize that fourth-line center role, Blake Lazat will not let go of it. Uh, and he's doing a great job. And so no complaints here. Again, no notes. Blake Lazat, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, he's my most uh, underappreciated unsung hero of the team. But a lot of different uh, various opinions from you guys out there, too. Best newcomer, again. No surprise here. Phil Deneau runs away with this category. Sean Dursey also gets a lot of love, as well as Arthur Kaliev. Uh, again, just can't say enough about how much Phil Deneau meant to this team and to see him buy in and uh, really become a leader very quickly. Uh, just chef kiss. Love every minute of it. And most improved player. This one, again, a lot of different, a lot of different responses, but uh, we're going to give it to Trevor Moore, Thousand Oaks native, Trevor Moore, I've said it before on the show, I'll say it one last time. There is a point in Locked on Kings history, you can probably go find it if you're really, really bored someday, that I looked at uh, I looked at a game and I said, I don't know what this guy is doing here. Uh, what, I don't know that I need to see him anymore. Uh, Trevor Moore turned things around very quickly. I, th I think that there was even, I'm pretty sure it was him, that Todd McClellan was like, listen, I sat him down, I talked to him, we talked about what we need to see from him, and then he did better, and he did. Uh, Trevor Moore, I think, again, breakout season from him, uh, really showing the kind of energy he can bring to this team. Uh, the, the impact shorthanded, I think, is amazing. Uh, so big, big season for him. Adrian Kempe, though, 
Uh, can't deny that one either. A huge breakout season for him. Uh, excited to see if he can replicate it. You know, it's one thing to have one really good season. Uh, it's going to be another thing to see if he can do that consistently. See if he can be a 30-goal scorer consistently for the Kings. Uh, but great improvement in his kind of all-around play, uh, defensively, uh, responsibility. Just, you know, the Kings have been looking for players in that sort of age range, that early to mid-20s age range, to step up and to become the next generation of leaders on this team. And uh, Kempe finally did it. So Kempe, Trevor Moore, the biggest nods for most improved players. So that's it for uh, for all of your votes on the second annual and now final, I guess, Locked on Los Angeles Kings end of season awards poll. I always love doing this. I love getting to see your thoughts and feelings on uh, who who has been impactful for the Kings. So thank you guys so much uh, for sharing. I'm sorry I didn't get to get any of you on the show. I know I asked uh, who would be interested in uh, jumping on the show. Sorry we didn't get to make that happen, but you're all on the podcast in my heart. I'm going to close things out with a couple of questions on Twitter that I took when I uh, asked for your thoughts and feelings this uh, as we sort of wrap things up here with me. So first off, thank you to all of you out there on Twitter for uh, giving me a, for just being so great. You make Twitter a fun place, which I feel like you can't always say about that, like, cesspool bird site, but you guys are all great. And uh, I thank you for being just awesome, awesome Twitter folks uh, for, for all the time I've been doing this show. But I threw it over to you guys, asked you if you had any burning questions for me as I uh, wrap wrap things up here. Uh, so I had a couple of questions from, from y'all. First up from Eric, who also has a great podcast of his own. You should go listen to it uh, called Pacific Revision. Go check out Eric's podcast. Favorite underrated Kings player during my time? Uh, um, the question is on the show, but I'm going to go with before the show. Um, I mentioned one earlier, which was Nick Shore, uh, who just but yeah, very underappreciated. Uh, just your standard defensive fourth line center. Like when he's out on the ice, literally nothing is going to happen. And that's great. One of the other names that comes to mind for me is Nick Dowd, who I was just like furious when the Kings traded him. Uh, and he has been doing great in that bottom six fourth line center shutdown kind of guy role with the Capitals. Uh, obviously moving him there made sense. You know, his development trajectory timeline doesn't really didn't really match up with where the Kings were. Did him a solid of sending him to a, a team where he was going to make the playoffs, whatever, uh, win the cup uh, with, with them. But just real mad when they traded him. Uh, but I, I think again, really underrated, underappreciated player, uh, Nick Dowd. I just have a really big fondness for those players who they're not going to score you a lot of goals, but they're not going to get scored on either. I think that's very fun. My favorite Kings dog ever. This is a tough one. Favorite dog ever. Meatball Luff. Easy. He's just so round. He's so round and tubby. Meatball Luff. Done. Uh, which actually goes along with the next question, uh, which came from James, which is my love letter to Meatball Luff. Listen, I love a good, fat, dumb bulldog, and that is what Meatball Luff is. Uh, just, again, very round, very lazy. Uh, Matt Luff, if, if we had a, a category, on the award, category on the awards for best not Kings player anymore on social media, Matt Luff would be up there. Very entertaining. Lots of good meatball content. Again, I love just a good old lazy dog. And Meatball Luff fits that category. Uh, finally, rounding things out, questions from Jeff. Who do, who have I, wow, who have I enjoyed watching progress in their career the most? And who do I think is going to pop next season? Uh, next season, I'm going to go with, this is tough. I'm going to, I'm going to cheat. This is my own show. I can do whatever I want. Quentin Byfield, Arthur Kaliev. I think both of those guys put it together. I think they both get the opportunity to show what they have. And all these people who are like, oh, trade Quentin Byfield. I think you're all just going to have to chill out. Um, I, I think that, you know, especially Byfield with a healthy summer with a full training camp. Uh, again, he's a guy who, when we were going into the regular season, you know, by the time we got to that last preseason game, I was like, all right, he gets it. He's going to look good. 
he, you know, he's ready. Let's put him in the NHL. And then he broke his ankle. Uh, I'm really excited to see what he can do uh, to see him grow into his body more and figure, figure out how all the limbs work together. Uh, Arthur Kaliev, I feel like had a taste. Uh, I think that he's going to, you know, we're probably not going to be able to put him up in the top six because of the Philip Forsberg ac acquisition. Uh, it doesn't look like we're going to move those guys around very much, but I, I, I want to see him take that ownership of his sort of middle six role and really run with it. Uh, I'd love to put Byfield and Cali up together. Like, let's just make it happen. They did it in the AHL. Uh, I, I just want to see it. Who have I enjoyed watching progress in their career the most? You know, I probably would have said like Cal Peterson, except for the fact that he totally blew it last season. Kempe feels too easy. Um, but I think Kempe is up there. Yeah. Kempe. I would have said I follow, but he also kind of had a mess season. Yeah, we're going to go Kempe. I feel like he's a guy who, you know, uh, have always kind of pulled for uh, since he was drafted. Uh, watching him in Ontario, you know, come right over after his Swedish season was done, win the Calder Cup with Ontario uh, or with Manchester at the time. Um, finally have the breakout season after years of being shoved into a center role that didn't fit him. Uh, finally gets put back to his natural wing position, and ta-da, looks great. It's amazing. Um, also, I'm going to cheat and say Phil Deneau. Uh, if you are newer to the show, you might not know. I got my start covering Chicago uh, and was covering them at the time that Phil Deneau was drafted and was part of their prospect system, and I always thought really highly of him as a prospect uh, and uh, you know, watching him in the AHL, watching him make his NHL debut, uh, and was really annoyed when Chicago traded them, traded him. That was a terrible trade. It's still a terrible trade, uh, but, you know, watched him in Montreal, watched him really develop there, uh, become a fan favorite with the Canadians as well. Uh, and now that he's he's come back home to me, he's come to the Kings. Uh, so I really enjoyed watching him uh, become that defensive center that we all knew he could be. And then this year, adding the offense. It's like Christmas. It's great. So that is it for questions from you guys for our team awards. Uh, and for me. So I want to say thank you to all of you out there who have watched the show, who have, you know, sent me messages on Twitter, who have been engaged with the content and uh, who are entertaining and who are nice. Thank you to all the people who are nice, because this is the internet. And a lot of times people aren't nice, but you guys are all great. Uh, it's been a delight hosting the show and getting to talk about the Kings and the rain and whatever I feel like uh, all the time for you guys. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss you guys. I'm going to miss uh, having an avenue to uh, foist my thoughts out onto the world, like talking about, is Alex Iafalo a werewolf? Is he? Maybe. I don't know. No one ever said he isn't, so he could be. But no, you guys have been great. Uh, this has been just a really, really fun time. And while I don't know what's next, while I don't know uh, exactly where I'm going to turn up covering the Kings, uh, I will always be on Twitter at right said Sarah. You can find me there as I continue to just yell about this team uh, to no one in particular now because I won't have a podcast. But again, thank you so much. Be excellent to Eddie Garcia as he takes over. He has a lot of uh, great, you know, just he's just a great guy. He's a great guy. I've enjoyed talking with him over the past couple of weeks, doing shows with him. Uh, and I'm really excited for him to lead Locked on Kings into the next, like, century is not the right word, into the next era of the show uh, as the team kind of continues on in their quest for the Stanley Cup and to make it back to the playoffs and be relevant and great and awesome and everything. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. It's been a delight. I hope that uh, all of you have had at least some amount of fun uh, with me, even if it's just been, you know, laughing at my expense or bad jokes or something like that. So that is it for today. Make sure you're following the show on Twitter at Locked on LA Kings. Uh, again, it won't be me tweeting there anymore after the weekend, but uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Right Said Sarah, where I will always be uh, yelling about sports and cats and other stuff. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to the show. Make sure you're following the show uh, wherever you get your uh, podcasts. Find us on YouTube. Uh, subscribe, get notifications, say hello, tell your friends, and uh, come back on Monday for a brand new look of Locked on Los Angeles Kings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.